You know, we've really been enjoying this series that we've been doing, and I don't know how long it's going to go, because, you know, as we were saying, God has put the characters in the Bible for us to learn from, for us to learn the good things to do, and the things they did that weren't so good to avoid. And, you know, they weren't so fortunate to be blessed like this, especially in the Old Covenant, to be able to have this to look back on and to you know, to, to study from. But we've been really blessed, and we, we are on uh, part nine, actually, and last week we talked on Elijah, and if you haven't heard it, in fact, if you haven't heard any of these, I encourage you to go back and listen to those. Um, they've been a real blessing, and so this time we're doing, you got to, after Elijah, you got to do Elisha. Now, it's amazing how their names sounds so much alike, especially since Elijah just followed in the footsteps, Elisha following the footsteps of Elijah. Um, so we're going to be talking about that today. Um, and um, so go back, listen to all the other ones. We had a lot of ones that were very exciting. And, and uh, next week we'll be doing, uh, it was so funny. Um, last week I said we're going to be doing Queen Esther. But instead of saying Queen Esther, I said Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> but anyway, no, it is Queen Esther. That's the one we're going to be doing uh, next week. So anyway, let's look at let's go in the Bible and look at 2 Corinthians 5. Y'all know these scriptures, and we've been repeating these because this is so important. You know, we talked about how important it is to live life looking forward and never living life in the rearview mirror. You, you will end up having a wreck. If you continue to focus on the past, what you wish you had done, what you could have done, or what, what you, you know, all of those regrets from yesterday, or man, you know, yesterday I, I was a success and I did this, that, and the other, and you, you focus on yesterday, whether it be good or bad, and then it hinders you from being able to move forward in your future. So let's look at 2 Corinthians five seventeen. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, how many of you are in Christ? All right, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away, and behold, all things. Everybody say all things. All, all things have become new. But you know what? You have to make the choice to allow all things to become new, don't you? That's right. Because before we know it, we slip back into that old man and find ourselves looking at some of the regrets or some of the things that we wish that had been different. But you know what? God can change everything in an instant. How many of you know that? So, all right, Philippians 3, 13 through 15, and we're pressing on towards the goal. It says, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do know, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, this is so important, therefore, let us, as many as are mature, remember, after a while, you don't just live on milk. You need to eat solid food. Eat the meat of the word. Get in there and study to show yourself approved. But it says, therefore, as many as are mature, having this mind, if anything you think otherwise, remember, as a man thinks, so is he. So you need to be thinking on those things in Philippians chapter 4, where it says, that are lovely and of a good report. Amen? Um, but anyway, it says, as many as are mature, have this mind. What mind? This mind of Christ. And if you think anything otherwise, God will reveal even this unto you. And as you spend time with the Lord, he will let you know when you've fallen back into ways that are pulling you off of your destiny. How many of you believe that? All right, Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. He will work it out. He will do it. You're the vessel. You just remain the vessel and allow him to do the work through you. But the only way he can do that is for you to spend time with him. Amen. Also, Isaiah 43, 18 and 19 says, Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. That shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And that's what's happening right now. That's what God is doing. He's doing a new thing. It's really, really powerful, and he's just getting started. I'm telling you, it's going to be signs, wonders, and miracles 
unusual signs, wonders, and, and, and miracles. And people just coming up out of uh, deathbeds, people coming up out of wheelchairs, all kind of things. And this, we're on the verge of that. We're in the, it's like Andrew Womack says, he says, we're not approaching the third great awakening. We're in the third great awakening. How many of you believe that? Amen. 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 Powerful. All right. So as we start talking about Elisha, now I don't have time. We're not going to take the time to go and review everything about Elijah that we talked about. But you're going to find some parallels here. And you're also going to find some differences here between the two. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And how does any of this relate to us or help us in our life? You know, we're going to start in 1 Kings 19, verse 16. And that's where... God spoke to Elijah, and uh, he's telling him what he is supposed to do. In verse 16, it says, Also you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shapheth, and Abel, uh, of, and Shapheth, y'all, these words, these names, <laughs> uh, we'll do the best we can, Shapheth of Abel, Mehola, I thought that was pretty good. That's good. Uh, you shall anoint <laughs> as prophet in your place. So both of these men were prophets, okay? So Elijah was to anoint Elisha to be prophet. Now, so then what was Elijah going to do? Elisha going to do? So in 1 Kings 19, 19 through 21, so he departed thence and he found Elisha, the son of Shapheth, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him and with the 12th and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him and, and he left the oxen and he ran after Elijah now this is Elisha and he ran after Elijah and said let me I pray thee kiss my father and my mother and I will follow thee now he did all of this because he wanted to do everything in excellence he wanted to take care of what he needed to take care of so he could move forward and never look back like what we've been talking about moving forward and he said to him go back again for what have I done to thee and then he returned back from him and he took the yoke of oxen and he slew them he boiled their flesh with the instruments of oxen and he gave it to the people and they did eat and he arose now look what he did and I want you to see we're going to spend some time on this and he said he arose and he went after Elijah and look what it says and ministered unto him now this is very important he ministered unto him. Now, Elijah was the one that was anointing Elisha, but Elisha ministered to Elijah. Now, how did he do that? He served him. Mm -hmm. The scholars have, have uh, in all of the scholars that have studied this out, they said that was about a 13-year period of time. But let's look at the word minister. And it's, in Hebrew, it's sarat, S-A-R-A-T. And that's the primitive root. And to attend as a menial or a worshiper, figuratively to contribute to, to serve, to be a servant to, to wait on, and to minister to. These are, this is what this means. So he took the time to minister to him because he wanted, how many of you know, he wanted a double portion. He wanted the double portion of what Elijah had. He wanted to go forward and do greater accomplishments and things. He wanted to know that, he, man, I am going after this man. I'm going to learn everything I can from him. But in the process, I am going to be ministering to him. I am going to serve him. I am going to do everything he needs to be a right arm to him. That's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do moving forward. Let, let me say this, though. Even though he wanted a double portion, I don't believe that was his total motivation. Elisha had a compassionate side about himself. And he had more of a servant's heart. And we'll talk about this in a minute. I guess we can talk about it now. Okay. Uh, the, the difference between the two is Elijah was a true, what you would look, think about an Old Testament prophet. He was a bony, bony fingered, shaking in your face. And, a, you know, just, just no, just not a whole lot of grace, but just, just told it like it is. And this is the way it is. And he was somewhat harsh. And, and, uh, but the difference in he, Elijah and Elisha 
was the fact there was a compassionate side to Elisha. And he cared and he liked to reciprocate when people did things for him. And so that was, that was a difference. But, so I think he had a heart not only, I don't think it was because, well, you know, if you see me when I go off in a chariot of fire to heaven and you watching me and you stay with me the whole time, then you'll get that double portion. But I believe also he had a heart for Elijah. And he just had a love for him, and, and he wanted to serve him. I believe he served him out of joy. I believe he, oh, he yeah. ministered to him, you know, and that, that, that as most scholars are, are, are in agreement around 13 years, that's a long time. I mean, we've been in this building 13 years. That's a long time. And, but they are, you know, I believe he did it as because I love this man, and God's placed me here, and this is where I'm going to be. You know, um, you saw where you want to go in life. You know, and Van and I have such respect for Andrew Womack. He has ministered so much to us, and his ministry has really changed our life. And so Van and I have done that very thing ourselves. and for the last 12 years, we have served Andrew Womack. And the, when I say we have served him and ministered him, actually, 12 years ago, Van and I created for him the Continuing Education for Ministers, because Van and I have a heart for pastors and ministers. And we wanted to be a blessing. And so he has a, for his Bible school, Van and I created the Continuing Education for Ministers, and we actually travel around the United States with Andrew. On the Gospel uh, Truth Conferences. For his Gospel Truth Conferences. And they have and four we, a year. Right. Yeah. And we promote those. Yes. And, um, and at their ministers uh, conference that they do as well, we, we promote it there. Because it was our heart's desire. We said, Lord, we want that kind of anointing. We want to understand the balance of grace and faith. We want to operate in that so that people understand the finished work of the cross. So they understand that it's always God's will to heal, and it still is. Even when you see people pass away, even yeah. when you see, it's like Andrew said, yes, there are people he's prayed for that have passed away. He said, but that's because we're in a fallen world. But you know what, y'all, that doesn't mean the Bible is not true. That's right. Everything the Bible says is true. And by the stripes on Jesus' back, we are healed. And we walk in that divine health. You know, one of the things we have to guard against is the fact of if we try to take the word and then we see somebody else's experience, whether they're a relative or a friend or whatever, or they knew somebody and this is the experience they had, then we try, some to have the tendency or to, to waver in what we believe based on their experience. And you can't, we can't do that. We have to keep our eyes on Jesus. We have to keep our eyes on the word and not say, well, this happened to them, so therefore maybe this doesn't mean that. Maybe it's not exactly what I thought. It is what you thought. It is the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it will not return void. It does accomplish that which it was set forth to do. So don't be moved when things, situations happen or different people have disappointments or things. We don't know what's going on in their hearts and not just anything wrong going on in their hearts, but we're not in the situations. But there again, you know the word and the word is in front of you and you have to devour the word. You have to eat it up. You have to, you have to eat the text. You have to let it be devoured in your heart. And, and you, you, it's, I forget, was it Job said, I, I devour your food, as ne I, I, I eat it up as necessary food. And it's just so important to do that. And it's important to immerse yourself in the word so that when things do happen around you and you say, wow, that seems contrary to the word that you won't be moved to look at that, but you'll keep your focus on Jesus and keep your focus on the promises of God, which are all yes, yes and what? Amen. Amen. Yes. You know what? I think it's important for us to understand, too. You know, that's why we break this down and how it applies to us. Yes, Van and I were talking about serving another man's ministry. Yes. And we did that all along the way from the time we married before we ever knew we were going to pastor a church. Yes, many years We before. helped start many other churches and we helped uh, Help. those pastors. Those and we pastors started their church. Them, yeah. Those yeah. pastors. Yeah. But y'all, it's also in the work working world. It's, it's also in, in whatever you're doing in your careers. This isn't just about ministry. Well, it is ministry in your whatever do you well, do. Well, that's true. Yeah, you but minister it's to people, serve them. It's not the five-fold ministry. Right. You know, um, the Bible says in, in Colossians 3, 17, it says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. You know, when, when I was, when Van and I first were married and I was working, some of you know the story, so I'm not going into a lot of detail here, but I was, um, I was a front desk clerk at a, at a Holiday Inn. 
I had worked at many hotels. I was working my schedules because they have shift hours. I was trying to work to stick with his shift hours because he was on shift hours with Delta. And we were trying to get together as often as we could, which wasn't a whole lot in those first days. But I had this woman that was my immediate boss that was me as a snake. That woman, everybody, nobody liked her. But I still served her. I still did everything I could do as unto the Lord. And do you know, people are always watching. Your fruit and your gifts will make room for itself. Do you understand what I'm saying? And man, when the, when the uh, front office manager saw what I was doing, she called me into her office one day and I thought, uh-oh, what happened? And uh, she said, you know, I've been watching you, Regina. And she said, I'm, I'm about to promote you. Do you know she promoted me over that? She it made me her assistant front office manager. So then that lady was then under me. Well, she changed her tune real quick. <laughs> she, it was really funny. But the whole thing is, I didn't do anything for the woman. I did it for the Lord. Do you understand what I'm saying? So whatever your job is or whatever you're doing, if you do everything is unto the Lord, mm -hmm. just like what Elisha was our example, what he did for Elijah, he served that man. That's right. He gave to that man. So, you know, you, it's a sowing and reaping principle. You sow where you want to go. And that's not just finances. Man, you give up your time. The Bible says with what measure you give out, it is given back unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. If I sow time, do you know Van and I sowed time for years into these other churches and into different things, and we didn't have a lot of time for ourselves. And we said, Lord, we are sowing this time knowing that one day we are going to be together all the time. And now we have been for... 26 years. 26 years. And it's been awesome. Yeah. It's been awesome because we sowed that and we did that as unto the Lord. So when you do your jobs and when you do whatever you're doing, if you do it as unto the Lord, you watch. You sow time, you reap time. You sow love, you reap love. Now, you may sow love. You know, I sowed love to that woman, but she never received it. But you know what? I got love back. Mm -hmm. from first yeah, you don't always get, it, it reciprocates and you get whatever you sow, you reap, but you're not... Don't always reap it from the same source, but God is not mocked. You will reap it. Amen. Absolutely. So we wanted to talk about that. And see, it's the same way Van did when he was with Delta. Yeah. I mean, I'm telling you this. Yeah, man. I was at Delta for a total of uh, three weeks shy of 18 years. And my first, uh, let's see, from started in 78. And in, let's see, by the time 89 rolled around, I'd been there for 11 years. I'd never been late and never missed a day of work in 11 years. Lived and lived downtown Atlanta, and uh, you know, we went down there. Well, lived part of the time in downtown, part then on Old National Highway in College Park. But that was a that was a mindset of mine that you know, no, you know, I I mean, I had sick days available, but I mean, even if the enemy tried to put something on me, I just kept going, kept going, kept going. So, pushed through it. But. And the only time that I really was ever out was when I broke my leg in uh, 1989, during December of 89, and I was out of work for 60 days, and I was like a caged animal. It was like, oh my gosh, I need to be there. I, I want to be there. And it wasn't that I was just, you know, so, just like I, I was by the law, but, you know, it was inside of me to, to whatever you do in word or deed, as do as unto the Lord. So those 60 days were the only days I missed in 18 years by being out and and we're never late other than that uh, that, that time from, from he was when so I broke the leg, so. to doing this in excellence that when he broke his leg the first thing he said to me bones are poking out of his leg y'all and first thing he said to me was call carol sue and tell her i might be late for work i said you are insane i, I said we are calling an ambulance right now well i, I said I, that while i was I, crawling back up our stairs he blood, blood everywhere yeah i mean you know i mean it was insane i said have you lost your mind? I said, we are calling an ambulance. I mean, I called. I went of course, around. they sent like two fire trucks out with the ambulance to make Javan a big show up. Javan's three and a half crying. And the neighbors night. are putting on bathrobes <laughs> and coming out and peeping around and all that. And I thought, we don't need all this drama going on here, Steph. So. <laughs> Javan said, Daddy, fire trucks. Fire. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't need a fire truck. Start. It was so funny. But anyway, they took me to Kenneth, Kenneth Stone Hospital. And, uh, and then he said I was the in the doctor. emergency room. Uh, and back there, the, the doctor comes in after I've been there four hours, and it's like four o'clock in the morning. And I said, "You know what? 
it's getting close to me at work. I have to be at work at eight down at the airport and stuff like that. So you he said, whatever you do, well, you, you got to do it quickly. He said, you, you're not going anywhere. He said, you're going to have an operation here in about 30 minutes. I said, <laughs> and so anyway, he, they put me to sleep and stuff. And then I woke up in the bed and went back in the room after a, a, an operation on the leg. And, and, um, uh, it was like a couple hour operation. And, and, uh, and, um, my first thing, it, I, I said, how much longer before I can go back to work? <laughs> I think that, you know what? It's one thing to have a good work, eth work ethic, but it's another thing to just be stupid. And I was stupid, <laughs> you know? So I think it was a little bit, uh, you know, aired on the other side. But, but anyway, it's so important, though, to, to be faithful and to do what God's called you to do to the, to the utmost that you can. Not living under the law. Not living under performance, right. but living by grace, by the grace of God. And grace, remember, like I said in Titus 2, 11 and 12, it does, Titus chapter 2, 11 and 12, it, grace doesn't enable you to live sloppy. It doesn't enable you to sin. It teaches you how to walk above all of these things. Grace Amen. is your teacher. All right, you ready? All right, so now let's go on and, and talk about when Elijah was taken up. Okay, 2 Kings. If you look along with me, and we'll have it on the screen, 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. Came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgad. And then Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, please. Now he's trying to, you know, not discourage him, but just trying to locate, just to see how much tenacity that Elisha had. Because the whole thing is, you got to be watching. You know, this, that's, you know, you know if you've heard these contests and stuff and says, must be present to win? Must be present to win. It wasn't these, well, you know, don't have to be present to win. You've got to be present to win. And so he said, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elijah said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to, to Elijah and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from you today? Now, that's amazing. That's the, the sons of the prophets. It's like a prophet school. And they're telling him, you know, did you know Elisha? Do you know he, that God's going to take him away today? Now, they, they didn't know that it was going to be a, a horses, horses of fire and chariots and all that. They didn't have, weren't privy to all that. But they knew he was going to be taken, taken away and stuff. And, and so the response from, from Elijah was, and he said, yes, I know. Now keep quiet. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, uh, then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elisha and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And it's like, what part of do you keep quiet? Do you not understand? <laughs> They kept doing that. So he answered and said, yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. Elisha is saying, this, that's just not going to happen. So the two of them went on and 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance. And while the two of them stood by the Jordan, now Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, struck the water of the Jordan and it was divided this way and that way so that the two of them crossed over on what kind of ground? Dry, Dry ground. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like the children of Israel and the Red, and the Red sea. sea being parted? Sounds very much like it, doesn't it? Okay, in Matthew 11 and 12, you can just hold your finger where you are in, the, in that in that second Kings, but Matthew 11 and 12, the word says, and from the days, verse 12, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violent, and the violent take it by force. So why is that verse? Why did we put that verse in there? The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, but those who are violent in their faith, in their tenacity, in the possession of the things of the kingdom, those are the ones that are going to take it by force. It's not namby-pamby folks not going to get it. You know, really that's and truly. Elisha was like determined. He said, I will not. That's right. I will be with you yes. everywhere you go. That's Whatever right. you do, that's right. I will follow you and I will be there when you're taken up. Yes. That it's not, in other words, you are not going to get rid of me. I will be there with you like, like white on rice. 
I'm not going anywhere, and, and I'm going to see you. Whatever needs to happen, you, I will be right there uh, with you, and you cannot discourage me. There's nothing you can say to get me to change my mind. All right, 2 Kings 2, 9, it says, And so it was, when they had crossed over, that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I may do for you before I'm taken away from you. And Elisha said, Please let me have a double portion of your spirit be upon me. And so he said, You have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, See, this is what we're talking about right here. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be done for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Mm. Man, don't you know that Elisha didn't even, not, did not even lay his head to rest? No. I guarantee you. He didn't blink. He, he, no, he was determined. You know, um, and then it happened as they continued on and talked. And suddenly a chariot of fire. Now, y'all just imagine. I mean, we can't even imagine these things. Now, this is why people who are analytical have a hard time with the Word of God. Because you can't analyze this stuff. That's right. You can't figure this out. Lean on when your own says, understanding. You have to lean on the Lord. And it says, and then it happened, as they continue to talk, then suddenly a chariot of fire, picture a chariot of fire, appeared with horses of fire, fire of chariot, fire, I mean, a fire. I mean, it doesn't make sense. And separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Now, y'all remember we talked about Elijah last week. Two of the three things that the Lord told him to do, he only did one of them. Mm -hmm. and this was the one that he told him to do. One that he did do was to uh, pass on his mantle yeah. to Elisha. Yes. So he didn't, and, and remember how he got afraid? He said, man, he was a man that was full of faith, and he did a lot of things, and he killed all the, the prophets of Baal, the 450 prophets of Baal, and, and the other 400 prophets that, that were uh, prophets that were not of God. He killed him with a sword by himself. And then this woman comes along and says, boo. And he runs and hides in the cave. Jezebel. You know, so he had some issues. Oh, Jezzy. I mean, how do you go and you do all these wonderful things and, and you're not afraid of anything. And then some woman comes along and says, boo. And you run and hide in a cave. And then you tell the Lord, I'm no better than my father. Just kill me. So Elijah, in the natural, didn't have it all together. But yet he was still the one chosen. It shows you when you are chosen of God, it's not about your performance or who you are, whether you are perfect or not, because yes, you won't be. That's right. And if you think you are, then that shows you really aren't. Because that's pride. You know, nobody was perfect but Jesus. So it wasn't about Elijah being a perfect man that God chose him to be the one that was taken up and never had to suffer death or never had to go through a death. No, it was about the Lord God and his calling on his life. You know, sometimes you're going to make mistakes. God will call you to different things. And sometimes you'll make mistakes. Yeah. But it's not about your performance that determines where you're going to end up in life. It's about his performance and his grace. Yeah. You know, you're just living by faith. Your part is the faith part. His part is the performing part. You just be the vessel and allow him to do the work through you. But Elisha, on the other hand, did everything the Lord said, and it never showed him having that kind of fear. But yet, in the, in the Mount of Transfiguration, who was the one that was chosen? To represent the to law. To represent the I mean, the prophets. prophets, yes. Moses for the law, Elijah for the prophets. And do you know, Moses Jesus and the new covenant. Elijah both made mistakes, and both of them asked God to kill them. Mm -hmm. Both of them. So there were times when they were weak. But you know what? The Bible says when we are weak, what? He is strong yeah. within us. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. So I don't know about y'all, but all of that ministered so much to me. So as, but you know what? As he asked Elisha, asked Elijah for a double portion. That's amazing. But do you know what we have in the new covenant? It, as it, born it again makes that look believers. Pu puny in the old co covenant. Absolutely. Yeah. So in the new covenant, oh my gosh, we are, as it says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, we are complete in him because we have all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It says, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principalities and powers. In John 1, 16, it says, and of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. Do you know he's even given you grace to receive his grace? Mm -hmm. He has given you yeah. grace to receive his grace. Y'all, I am telling you, in the new covenant, what we have is so much greater than all of these Old Testament people than all of them under the Old Covenant. 
Don't you understand? Man, you can do anything. You can do all things through Christ who gives you the strength. Remember, it's no longer you that's living anyway. It's Christ who lives in you and the life which you now live in your flesh. You live by the faith of the Son of God. He's even given you his faith. All you have to do is say, yes, Lord, and operate Amen. in it. Amen. That's your part. Yes. Amen. Is this blessing you? Yes. Amen. Praise God. Is my mic still on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. 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 Look at 2 Kings 2, 13 through 15. So Elijah took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him, struck the water, and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had struck the water, it was divided the way and th this way and that, and Elijah crossed over. Does that sound familiar? Same exact. scenario, same yeah. Jordan, and same, the same, same took the mantle, took the mantle the broke thing. it, the water uh, spread apart, and walked over. Now when the sons of the prophets who were there, who were from Jericho, saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. I think that particular, what he did that right there, just solidified in these sons of the prophets because a lot of them, you know, even though they know he's going to be knew that Elijah was going to be taken away, they weren't. They didn't really have a big track record with Elisha, and they weren't really sure because he was going to step into that office that Elijah had as the big prophet cheese of the planet. And and uh, so when prophet he prophet cheese of the prophet planet. cheese is a term. You look it up. Okay, it okay, is. Yes. Prophet cheese of yes of the planet. Of the planet. Uh -huh. Okay, that's You can good. look under of the planet or prophet or cheese and okay. then pull it up. So <laughs> anyway, so. <laughs> anyway, when when I think that that whole uh, miracle was emulated to show these other prophets, uh, the school of the prophets, that look, this is, you were impressed when that when Elijah did this. It was a, a very notable miracle, and now Elisha has done identically the same thing. So you need to receive him in your heart as the, as the replacement. He's, he's the man. So I really believe that's the case. So what we're going to do today, um, there is so much more written about Elisha than there is Elijah because Elisha did double that's right. the number of miracles because that Elijah did. Because he had the did. double portion. It was a double portion. So yes. what we're going to do is we're going to do, go through just a few of these. Right. And you're going to see the comparisons. Um, Basically, it was like eight, eight, to, eight to six. Eight, eight to sixteen. No, I mean eight. Eight, eight for, for Elijah, Elijah and, and like sixteen, 16. for for right. Elisha. And what what you can do is you can you can study it on your own. It's all in the Second uh, Kings up to the thirteenth chapter, I believe. Uh, but anyway, you can study it out for yourself. We're going to go through just a few of these. Hit hit some of the high spots. Um, but now remember how Elijah had the widow woman mm -hmm. that went and provided for him. You remember the widow woman and and um, everything that went on there. So. Um, we're going to talk about Elisha's widow woman. So, if you'll go to 2 Kings 4, 1. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor has come to take my two sons to be slaves. Now, this is what happened in the Old Covenant that if you could not pay your bills, they would come and take your children, become slaves for the payment. Now that's evil. That is evil. And so she's telling him, man, you gotta do something because they're gonna take my children from me, my children that I love so much, and they're going to have to become slaves. Um, and Elijah said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in this house? Now, this is so important for you to get this understanding. And she said, your master, uh, your maidservant here, I have nothing in this house but just this jar of oil. That's all I have. But you know what? The Lord says, take what you have yes. and I will multiply it. That's right. If you offer up what you have, yeah. it'll be multiplied back unto you. And this is what happened here. So um, then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere. Now, you know what? All of this is going to require a lot of faith. Go require vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels, and do not gather just a few. Man, put your faith out there. Stretch your faith. Yeah. Stretch your faith big time. Go out and get every vessel you can find anywhere. Mm -hmm. 
Now, I don't think she even realized what all this was going to be about, but, he, but she did what he said. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. Now, what was the purpose of this? Because there's a lot of unbelievers out there. And man, when you're believing God for something, you need to be careful who you tell what to. That's right. You need to keep it close to you. Keep your, your cards your close to your chest. I'm telling you, yes. and, and you shut that door and you believe God. That's why even Jesus had to put people out of the room yeah. when he was raising the dead. Mm -hmm. Those that were in unbelief. That's right. You know, he said even in his own town, he could do no mighty works because of their, what? Their unbelief. Yeah. So they said, come in and you shut the door behind you. Then they poured into it all, into all of those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she brought and went in from him and shut the door behind her and her sons and brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. And now it came to pass when the vessels were full and, and she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. There was no more to be poured out. And then she came and she told the man of God and he said, go and sell the oil and pay your debt. You and your sons shall live on the rest. Y'all, I'm telling you what, if you believe God and you sow what you have, you give what you have, it'll be multiplied back unto you. You cannot ever outgive in the kingdom of God. That's right. That's you right. sow the seed yes. and it will produce a harvest. Mm -hmm. But you know, you go out to a field and you water a field that has no seed in it, nothing's going to come up. That's right. You know, it's like an apple. You can count that number of seeds in an apple. But when you plant those seeds, you can't count the number of apples in a seed. So when you sow, sow of yourself, sow of your time, sow of your finances, and believe God to give back unto you, good measure, press down, shake together, running over. I mean, this is so powerful right here. But he said, take what you have. Take what you have. And God is going to bless it and multiply it. What's in your hand? What did God say to Moses? Moses, what's in your hand? Rod. Oh, it's just a rod, God. Yeah. Look what that rod did. Yeah. Look what that rod did. But of course, then what happened? Then Moses looked to the rod rather than God to be his provision. And that was the thing that kept him out of the promised land. But y'all, I'm telling you, if you will take what you have and watch God multiply it, don't look to somebody else and what they have. Don't be envious or, or covet, what's the covetous. Word? covetous. 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 You know, say, God, I thank you for blessing what I have. And I give it to you to bless it. Mm -hmm. And you're going to give it back to me, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Amen. That verse 7, that last one that Regina just went over at, at a chapter 4 there. Look back real quick, if you will, with me. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debt. If it stopped right there, that would be insane. That would be miraculous because that was why the children were being taken away, because of the debt. So you would think, but we serve an exceedingly abundantly God. Amen. It was not enough in, in, for, in, for the Lord to, to, to work through Elijah just to get the children where they don't have to uh, be sold for the debt, to pay for that debt. Because really and truly, what would happen then? Because if they, okay, here you go, we're selling this, here's your debt's paid for. Well, they don't have any money, so they're going to end up getting back in debt again, right? That's not going anywhere. God doesn't leave you hanging. How many of you know God doesn't leave you hanging? Amen. He's, he's the Lord God. He's Jehovah Jireh. He's the Lord God who sees ahead and makes provision. Amen. And so what does the rest of that say? He says, go, go sell the oil, pay your debt, and you and your sons shall live on the rest. Now think about that. You mean to tell me there's enough money for them to live probably what? The rest of their lives or at least till the, the, till the children leave the nest and she lived the rest of her life? Because God provided for this Amen. widow woman. It's amazing. God's a God of, of grace and love in abundance. All right, 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8. Look at that, please. This is about Elijah uh, uh, raising the Shumanite's uh, woman's son. It happened, verse 8, that happened one day that Elijah went to Shuman where there was a notable, now that word notable, 
And, and when you look it up in the Hebrew, it means distinguished, well-to-do. Distinguished, well-to-do woman. And she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. And she said to her husband, look now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us on a regular basis. Please let us make a small upper room on the wall and let us put a bed in there for him and a table and a chair and a lampstand so it'll be whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. She, was, she was, had a heart towards this prophet. She a man of God. And she just said, you know what? He's going to need some place to lay his head and, and just let's, let's, let's lay this room out that, he, that would be just, just uh, solely for him to use. Verse 11. And it happened one day that he came there and he turned into the upper room to lay down there and he said to Gehaz, uh, his servant, this is Elijah saying, that, Elijah saying that to Gehaz, his servant, call the Shumanite woman. When he called her, she stood before him and he said to, she, he said to him, say, say now to her, look, this is Gehazi, look, you have been concerned for us with all this care. See, this is this heart of compassion that I was mentioning earlier that Elijah had that Elijah did not operate in. He said, look, 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 you have been concerned for us with all this care. What can I do for you? How can I reciprocate? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? You know what that, that, that signified? Elisha was connected. He said, you want me to speak to the king? You want me to speak to the commander of the army? He had access to all these people, and he's asking her if that would be a blessing to her. And she answered, she said, I dwell among my own people. And so he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, well, she actually has no son and her husband is old. And so verse 15, so he said, call her. And when he called her, she stood in the doorway. And then he said to her, about this, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. So see, it was divulged by Gehazi that he, had, he knew that she had no, no heir, no children, no anything else, and her, her husband was, was old age. And so he said, this time next year, you're going to have a son. And she said, now, now look, what, look what, she had such a guarded heart, she said, and she said, no, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. She didn't say, well, are you sure? She said, all right, man of God, don't you be lying to me now. You know, here he was trying to be sweet and, trying to, and gave her that word. She said that, but it just shows how much fear of disappointment she had. Like, now, you know, I know you can do miracles, but this would be too great a miracle. Verse 17, but the woman conceived and bore a son when the appointed time had come of what Elisha told her. And the child grew up, and it happened one day that he went out to the to his father, to the reapers, and he said to his father, my head, my head. Now, what was going on? Probably a lot of people think when you say, my head, my head, and it's hot outside, and you're out there with your father, and the reapers probably had to do something with heat, maybe sunstroke going on. And so he said to his servant, carry him to, the, to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to the mother, his mother, he sat on her knees till noon, and then he turned around and died. She went up, paid, uh, laid him on the bed of the man of God. Boy, that's presumptuous. She lay it on the bed of the man of God, shut the door upon him, and went out. Then she called her husband and said, Please send me one of the young men and one of the donkeys that I may run to the man of God and come back. So he said, Why, why are you going to him today? It is neither the new moon or the Sabbath. And she said, It is well. Now, the tenacity, the boldness, the, the, the fire of this woman. This son was brought back to her in a, uh, laying on the lap de dead because of heat stroke probably. And she takes him, has him taken up to the prophet's bed, laid on his bed, and then she says, saddle me a donkey because I'm going after the prophet. Oh my gosh. She didn't say, tell her husband to do that. She did that. Faith. Faith, amazing faith. Faith possesses. Faith takes a hold of. Faith grabs a hold of that which, in, in the New Testament, faith grabs a hold of that which Christ Jesus has already taken hold of for us. So grace is what God does. Faith is what we use to appropriate what he's already provided for us through the, in the Spirit. Amen? 
All right, so but here she is under the old covenant, and she tears out going to get Elisha. And, and she, she saddled a donkey, said to her servant, Drive and go forward. Do not be slackened for the pace for, for me unless I tell you. And so she departed, went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. So it was when the man of God saw her off, he said to his servant, uh, Gehazi, look, the Shumanite woman's coming. Please run and meet her and ask her, is it well? And it, is it well with your husband? Is it well with your child? So she answered, she said, it is well. Do you see what this woman said? It is well, and her son is laying dead on the prophet's bed back home. But you know what? She had faith. She believed. She believed that her husband was going to be, I mean, her son was going to be raised up from the, 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 the bed of death laying on there. And so she said, um, where did it say? It is well. Oh, it is well. Okay. Now when she came to the man of God at the hill, she caught him by the feet, but Gehazi came near to push her away. But the man of God said, let her alone, for her soul is in deep distress. And the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Now see, that's very unusual. The Lord was telling Elisha everything, but he said, the Lord has hidden it from me and not told me really about this. And so then in verse 28, it says, so she said, did I ask for a son of my Lord? But did I say, do not deceive me? Then he, he, then he said to Gehazi, get yourself ready. Take my staff in your hand. Be on your way. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. If you, anyone greets you, don't answer him. But lay my staff on the face of the child. So what is, why did he tell him that? Unbelief opportunities. You meet somebody, don't be listening. Where are you going? Well, I'm going, this woman's son died and I've got this staff, I'm going to put him on. Oh, that's not going to work. You're just wasting your time. When God, when you're on a mission for God, don't, as Regina says, don't keep it close to your chest. Keep your mouth shut. Don't tell everybody the facts because you think they'll understand and say, go, well, go, well, go. No, they'll say, I, th I don't believe, I think you're wasting your time. Next thing you know, you'll sit down with them and drink a Coke Cola and say, yeah, you're right. What's the use to even go? But that's not, that's not faith. So the mother and the mother of the child said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. Does that sound familiar? I will not leave you. So he arose, followed her. Now Gehazi went on ahead of them and laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Therefore, he went back to meet him and told him, he said, the child has not awakened. When Elijah came to the house, there was a child laying dead on the bed. He went in, therefore, shut the door behind the two of them, prayed to the Lord, and he went up and lay, the, lay, he lay on the child, put his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his hands, and he stretched himself out on the child, and the flesh of the child became warm. And he returned and walked back and forth in the house and again went up and stretched himself out on him. Then, he, and then the child sneezed seven times. Isn't that appropriate? That's the, <laughs> uh, that, the number of completion in the Bible is seven times, and the child sneezes seven times, right? Amen? Okay, and the child opened his eyes and he called Gehazi and said, call this Shumanite woman. So he called her and when she came in, he said, pick up your son. So she went in, fell at his feet, bowed to the ground, then she picked up her son and went out. See, there was a lot of drama in the middle of that healing. It wasn't just cut and dry. And it took some effort. It actually took some perseverance. It took some believing. It took some fire. It took some tenacity. So... If, if you have a situation in your life, you know, don't be worried about how much effort it may take or how much little, little effort it may take. Just be obedient to the Spirit of God. Be obedient to the Word. Do what the Word says. Stick with the Word. Don't come off of the Word. Don't listen to, don't run around calling uh, Sister Blabbermouth and calling uh, uh, whoever else and getting a, a prayer chain all set up because that prayer chain is going to be tainted. I can tell you that right now. You're going to have some doubt and some unbelief on that prayer chain. And you have folks talking against it and say, that girl, that woman, she's a nutcase. You don't, you don't want to, uh-uh, I, I, I got things to do. I ain't got time to mess with that kind of nonsense. No. Amen. You let your request be made known unto God and the, and the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. He's the one where you let Amen. your request be known. If you got people close by and they're, they're you know, they believe and 
and they won't they won't speak doubt and unbelief. It's okay to have a, a small group with you doing that. But don't just throw it out there wholesale and believe in everybody's going to be on the same sheet of music with you. They're not going to be. You know what? Let's do a little comparison here. Now, yeah. here he raised a woman's son from the dead. Yes. And so did Elijah. Yes. But the difference, and both of them actually laid on top of those boys. Yes. Now, but the, the difference is Elijah went in and he took the child and he shut the door and he said, God, what are you doing? Why are you going <laughs> to kill this child that I just, that this woman just fed me and now you're killing this. Did you see he's blaming God? You go back and look at it. But he was blaming God. Now that wasn't his word for word, but right. y'all. I'm telling you, do we sound like Andy Griffith telling stories? No, I sound like Andy Griffith. You don't sound like him. You sound like you, you sound like Aunt B. I sound like Andy Griffith. Anyway, anyway, but are y'all getting anything from these stories? It's good, isn't it? Hey, it's not Reader's Digest. We're doing the word here. But the difference is, I mean, look at the mercy of God yes. that he had for the, the, the son of the, the widow woman that Elijah prayed for. Because Elijah's blaming God. Yeah. Where was the faith in that? Mm -hmm. But Elisha didn't do that. Elisha went and he laid on top of that child and there was no words of doubt spoken. Mm -hmm. you understand, do you see what we're saying here? Yeah. Man, God loved those boys. And I just, I just thought that was something to talk about the difference. Now, y'all, we don't have time to go to these other stories. Let me just do this one real quick and then we're just going to tap... Uh, do a recap on a couple of them, but let's look at the Second uh, Kings four forty two, and this is when Elijah Elisha feeds one hundred men. Um, and forty two it says, then a man came from uh, Baal. Now I don't know Sh Shalisha? Shalisha. 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 That's yeah. good enough. That's close enough. Close enough. And brought the man of God bread of the. Now what does it say? First, First fruits. fruits. That's very important. Yes. The bread of the first Our fruits, fruits, 20 loaves of barley and newly ripened grain in his knapsack. And he said, give it to all the people that they may eat. Now, 20 loaves of bread is not going to feed 100 people. But the servant said, what? Shall, shall I set this before 100 men? And he said, give it to the people that they may eat. And thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left over. Mm. See, do you see this is just all these stories that you see over and over and over in the Bible, just different situations. So he said it before them and he ate and had some left over according to the word of the Lord. Now, doesn't that remind you of the New Testament? In Matthew 14, 13 through 21, it says the feeding of the 5,000. Yes. And in uh, Matthew 15, 32 through 39, the feeding of the 4,000. There was always baskets left over, one with 12 baskets, one with seven baskets. You know, what does the Bible say in Proverbs chapter 3? And it goes in there and it says, when you give up your first fruits, it says, so that what? So that your barns might be filled with plenty. Yes. You can't ever outgive. You give and, and it's going to be given back. Yes. Right. Exactly. So that your vats will overflow with new wine, that your barns will be filled with plenty. He wants you to be blessed. And the only, re the only reason he set all of this up is so that not only will you be blessed, you give of your first fruits. What does, what does that mean to give of your first fruits? When it means not just your salary, when it comes in, you say, well, okay, let's see what it is after taxes. You know, it says first fruits. That's before taxes. And when you give of your first fruits, do you want a, a, a after taxes blessing or do you want a before taxes blessing multiplied unto you? You know, he said, give of your first fruits. What does that mean? Of all of your increase, it says in the Bible. Of all of your increase. That means if you sell land, that means if you have a business, then you give of the first fruits of that business. When that business prospers, before you do anything, you take 10% off the top and you give it. And I'm telling you, watch what that business is going to do. It means when somebody blesses you with gifts, you give that. You give that. When they give you monetary, then you give that first fruits to the Lord. Y'all, I'm telling you, if you will ever do this and, and watch, you know, and then you'll get to the point where you get far above that and God blesses so much more. You can't ever outgive in the kingdom. But that's what it shows even in the Old Testament here, that that multiplication process of giving your first fruits. 
Amen? Because then I guarantee you all your bills will be paid. Now, we don't have time. It's almost 12, um, and we were going to do uh, Naaman's leprosy healed, and we also were going to do the floating axe. we got to do the floating axe. Let's do the floating axe. You want to do the floating axe? How many floating axe folks do we have in here? Let's do the floating axe. We'll do the floating axe. Right, you want to do the floating axe? Let's do the... <laughs> I mean, imagine... <laughs> so, let's read that. The floating axe, 2 Kings 6, 1 through 7. And the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See now, the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan and let every man take a beam uh, from there and let us make there a place where we may dwell. So he said, go. Then one said, please consent to your servants. And he said, I will go. So he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down the trees. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe, now it tells you, this is not a plastic toy. <laughs> the, the, you know, you see the little kids with plastic toys. This is not a plastic floating toy. This says here, the iron axe head fell into the water. And he cried out and said. How many of you know iron axe heads don't float? <laughs> that's right. Amen. Just like Peter walking on the water, you know. That, yeah, that's you know, right. It's the same thing. Um, anyway, where was I? Yeah, he um, fell in the water. Yeah, five. okay, so, but as one was cutting down a tree, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried out and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. Now i got to tell this man, I messed up your axe head. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's floating in the water, floating in the water. So the man of God said, where did it fall? And he showed him the place. So he cut off a stick, and he threw it in there, and he made the iron float. Yeah, yeah. Therefore, he said, Pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand and he took it. You know, these are miraculous things. These are not fairy tales. These are things that really did happen. They really did. You know what? The Bible says all of the word is inspired. Yes. All of it. All of it. Man, there is so much more we could share. But the main thing is we want you to see how Elisha took everything he learned from Elijah, he poured into Elijah, he served Elijah. Yes. He did everything in excellence. He never disobeyed the Lord. He never showed fear. Look what God did. It was a double portion. A double portion. No, I'm telling you what. I don't know about y'all, but you know, it's like Javan. Javan loves the Old Testament. There is a lot to be learned. And so many times people get in there and they read their daily Bible reading and they just want to get through the Bible in a year and they skip over every bit of this stuff. How many of you learned anything today? Did you see some things that you hadn't seen before? Y'all, that's why these characters are so important. That's why it's so important for us to break it down and see how does this help me? What can I learn from this today? But there again... If in my thinking, if I had the transfiguration and I was in charge of transfiguration guests and uh, invited, certainly Jesus is the new covenant and certainly Moses is the law. But I would think I would invite the one that had twice as many miracles, that had double the anointing of Elijah. But I, I really tell you, I think part of this was Elijah was a, was a groundbreaker. He, was, he went ahead of Elisha. And God honored him, even though two of the three things the Lord told him to do, he did not get done. And Elisha had to really pick up the pieces in those other two things. And by then, it was out of place, out of time, and it didn't have the positive effect it was supposed to do when Elijah, Elisha did it because it was needed for earlier years. And, you know, when, some, when God tells us to do something, it's important for us to do it right then, rather than somebody come behind us and do it later, and it did not have the same effect that it would have had in the beginning, because it was out of place in time. Do you all know what I'm saying here? And so, but anyway, Elijah was a trailblazer. I mean, you, you know, you had uh, uh, Samuel, was a great prophet, and he anointed David king, and he did things. 
but he was not out running around doing these wholesale miracles like Elijah and Elisha were and just doing That's this right. wild off the stuff kind of things. But Elisha set the course. He walked it out. He discipled Elisha. Yes. And actually set him on course to do even, it's almost like a son, a, a, a daddy and a son, to set them on course to do even greater things than they did. Amen. You know what? And think about this. Remember we said last week that Elijah was the first one recorded in biblical history that raised anyone from the dead. That's correct. First one ever. It was the first one. Mm -hmm. It's the first recording. Recorded. Now, first. if there was more than that, it wasn't Why noted was in the Bible. Right. So Elisha had already learned from Elijah. Mm -hmm. And what did he do? He did the same thing. That's he right. laid on top of the, That's the boy. That's right. That's right. Just like Elijah did. Mm -hmm. Now, and the, the fact that when Elisha laid on top of the boy, he put everything exactly the, where it was. His lips on he, his lips, his eyes on his it. eyes, and his yes. hand on his. Yeah. Now, we don't know if Elijah did that or not. But again, Elijah, Elijah was trying to do everything with a double portion. So he, he just made sure, man, I'm going to cover all the bases. So, you know, there's, there is a lot to be learned. But I tell you what, think about it. If no one had ever been raised from the dead before, that's been recorded in history, man, that was really something for Elijah to do. But Elisha only followed what he saw Elijah do before. That's right. And God is powerful. the one that gave him the, the, the double anointing came on him and took him even greater deaths. You know, those of you that are fathers, mothers in here, I tell you, I encourage you to never be intimidated what your children do. In fact, be expecting your children to do greater, greater things. Than, things than what you do. Even Jesus said, I go to my Father, and I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. But he said, you, you will do greater things than even I did when I was on, here on this earth because the Holy Spirit is coming. And y'all, you have the power to raise the dead. That's you have right. the power to land. In fact, you have the commandment. You know, go into all you. the world. Raise, you know, raise, raise the, the dead. dead. It, and he didn't say pray for the sick. What did he say? Heal, Heal the, the sick. sick. There's a big difference. Amen. He didn't say pray for them. The, the great commandment. It, it said, go into all the world. Raise the dead. Not pray for the dead. Raise the dead and heal the sick. We've got to be about the Father's business. We've got to imitate Jesus. And Jesus said, Go and do even greater things than what I did when I was on this earth. Amen. Amen. All right, stand to your feet if you would, please. Hallelujah. Thank, Thank you, you, Jesus. Thank you, Thank Lord. You, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you never ask him to come into your heart as your Lord and Savior. You've never been born again. You've become a new creature, new creation in Christ Jesus. Then... The word says you must be born again, that no one goes to the Father unless he goes through Jesus. You must be born again. So if you've never asked Jesus into your heart, you've never been born again, you've never received the free gift of salvation, then you need to do so today. If you're here in this sanctuary before you leave here, it's imperative you do that. And in a few minutes, we're going to ask them. We want the prayer, prayer ministers. ministers, if you'll come down front right now, we appreciate that and be down here ready for anybody we'd have come down. Uh, also, if you're watching on live stream, if you would, would just give us a call our, on our number, Regina and myself, 404-697-5215. You're either watching on live stream, if you're watching on, on uh, 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 our YouTube channel, if you're watching on our on Facebook, if you're watching on Roku, if you're watching on Apple TV, all, all those four platforms, we're simultaneously on all four. Any one of those, give us a call wherever you are. Talk to us. We'll lead you in a prayer of salvation. We also want to tell you about the baptism of the Holy Spirit with that evidence of speaking in other tongues. If you're here in the sanctuary, you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in other tongues, you need to do so. That's where the power is. Amen. That's where the power is. The kingdom of heaven is about power. Paul, the apostle, said, I don't come to you in eloquence of speech. Fancy words, $10 words. I come to you in demonstration of the power of God.
And we have the same, as born again believers, we have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead living in us. That same very, not a facsimile of that power, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead living, living in us. But we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues for that to be assimilated in us and come out of us and to do these great work, those, these works that are greater works than even Jesus did while he was here on this earth. So if you're here today, you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you never asked Jesus to baptize you in the Holy Spirit and with the evidence of speaking in the other tongues, either one of those invitations, come down here, let our prayer ministers minister to you. They'll be glad to, to lead you in those prayers. If you're watching on live stream, on that second invitation of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, call us on that, either one of those, 404-697-5215. All right, we're going to say about a live stream. Live thank stream, you for joining us. Everybody watching, wherever you are, thank you so much. Please join us again next Sunday, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we just hope you have a blessed week. We call blessings on you. Thank you for joining us. Okay.